We're ready to get started again now, so if you can take your seats or if you're dashing off somewhere else, make your way out of the door quickly. Our next talk is going to be Christopher Biggs talking to us about continuous dashboarding, our DevOps airbag. G'day everybody, my name's Christopher and I'm not a sysadmin. Um, I have, however, mentored, managed, trained, um, hired and, and worked with sysadmins for a long time. And I want to talk today about some things that I've learned over the last dozen or so years, working to keep web commerce and software as a service businesses alive with varying degrees of success. I want to tell you about why I think you should treat your business intelligence systems as seriously as your customer facing products. And I'm going to discuss some tools and techniques to help you do this. I'll talk about why it's important to consider that different users of your data have unique needs. And I'll talk about what kind of things you can do with your data beyond just projecting it on the wall. Next, I want to stress why it's valuable to have the same people who write code thinking about data and working on both of those at the same time. After this, we'll get a bit more practical and we'll look at how to apply DevOps principles to dashboards and data. So first, I want to consider the different consumers of data and how you need to serve them according to their needs and inclinations. Traditionally, dashboards have been for operations staff. They've been highly technical and detailed, measuring a huge number of things, but at a very low level, and often just not very pleasant to look at. Monitoring and alerting has focused on servers and services rather than the application domain. The other thing I've noticed is that operations people tend to learn a lot about the way that users and systems behave but don't often have an opportunity to pass that information and learning back up the development pipeline to help the people who are dumping releases onto operations people to be better at it. So the first group of people who aren't being served well by data are developers. Disk IO ops per second is, is not the most important thing to a developer. What they really need to know is whether their application is working. When I say application, I'm abbreviating the old term application software. That is software that does something. The key question here is did I as a developer achieve what I set out to do? Does my feature work? Is my user interface working the way I planned? Have I positively or negatively affected the experience of using this product? Did I advance the business plan? Businesses make money by providing services to customers and you need to understand that what are your true services and points of inter interaction? Understand what normal looks like and ensure that when something that is not normal happens, the right people know about it. Startups learn all the time that their understanding of what their users wanted was all wrong. And the key here is to learn that while you're still in business. Your customer facing staff have data needs too. Often the first time a business learns that normal has left the building is when the support phone starts ringing. I've found that for every person who calls, there's 99 who just go somewhere else. If you let your customers tell you about faults, it's too late. Wouldn't it be better if your support staff can know the probable cause of a customer issue before the customer has to explain it to them? Dashboards also might be the one regular communication you have with upper management. It's a cliche that every executive loves a big fat meaningless pie chart for breakfast. But if you give your management a steady diet of interesting and varied intelligence, then you have a way to draw a direct connection between your existence and the business bottom line. Your CEO probably doesn't see the day-to-day -day business of development, but this is your chance to show sprint to sprint value delivered by your teams. All right, now this one might be scary. Would you show your customers your performance data or your error rates? Why not? What are you afraid of? What are you ashamed of? Just asking yourself that question might teach you something valuable about your processes. Let's look at this another way. Data lets you soothe your customers. Every piece of software has a bad day, so if things aren't going well and you know about it, you can let the customers down gently. Give them your sympathy along with realistic expectations. Simply, people just appreciate sincerity. If you work with banks, you know they're a bit like elephants, inscrutable, difficult to win an argument with, source of mind-boggling amounts of excrement when you least expect it. If your third-party interfaces are on the fritz and you can learn about this, respond to it, you can head off customer in 
frustration before it happens. Finally, why do customers have to call us and report errors? You know the error happened, you threw an exception. Why don't you turn it around? Tell the customer you're on it. Give them a way to follow up. You could even promise to notify them as soon as the particular fault that affected them has been fixed. This could prevent your customers from simply taking their money elsewhere. So let's look at how data can help your support team. If you've instrumented your application, you've got the ability to query that data, then you can have the ability to reconstruct what a particular user did. This turns the act of supporting a customer from palm reading to brain scanning. You can, you can know what it is that potentially affected the customer and be able to help them much, much quicker. If there's a cluster of failures in your system, that's important information for your support staff and your customers to know. Finally, sometimes customers are not reliable witnesses. There's a whole class of common software problems that we can fix if we store more data, even if only for a few hours. So don't be parsimonious in recording analytic data. Record as much as you can, and if storage becomes a problem, then you thin it out later. Okay, so let's look at what kinds of data you should be shepherding. Going back to the traditional operations monitoring, what most people record is the vital statistics of their servers, a bunch of statistics that you really have to understand intimately to know if there's a problem or not. And nowadays, we have elastic servers and multi-tier architectures, and a simple graph of operations per second implicitly assumes that resources are fixed, which isn't really true anymore. What matters is money, or rather happiness, which money helps with. Are your customers, servers, and shareholders happy? Are they more or less happy than they were an hour ago? Another issue with traditional monitoring is its binary nature. Things are either good or they're not good and someone's getting turfed out of bed. But in reality, there are, there are a class of faults which are gonna be happening all the time, like natural background radiation. And what you want to know is whether or not there's a meaningful trend in level of occurrence. And I'm talking about things like credit card processing errors, can't find a template. There are certain things you just potentially can't get rid of. But again, it's a matter of working out what's normal and looking for exceptions and spikes, but adaptively, because today's normal might not be different from last week. Geolocation is handy too. Data breaches, denial of service, click fraud, these things are going on all the time. And if you can notice a sudden shift in your demographics, you may be alerted to imminent problems. I recall one case where the first warning we had that we were about to be the victims of a denial of service extortion attack was we started seeing browser market share changing um, unexpectedly. Um, long dead browsers coming back from the grave to, to visit our website. And we started looking into that and then within a few hours we knew without doubt that we were, we were being attacked. I encourage you to think hard about what makes your product nice to use or annoying to use and track some indicators. Are people navigating into blind alleys, experiencing poor responsiveness, abandoning operations half completed? Record some user sessions and make the designers and developers watch them. I guarantee that they'll, they will learn something. Third party interfaces are a big risk. They're often fragile, sometimes failures go unnoticed. Again, I recall an incident where an edge case in payment processing had been dropping money on the floor for two years, you know, six figures down the toilet, and wasn't picked up because of poor data quality of people just assuming it was a glitch in the data. Finally, if you're, if you're working with, in mobile apps, you have a big risk with faults because typically the first thing somebody does when their mobile app doesn't work is they don't even bother calling support. They go on the app store and they go one star, piece of crap, and that's the top of your, your review stream. And if you have a bad day and you get 20 of those, you could potentially be tanked and out of business. Um, secondly, you don't want lukewarm reviews either. The tools are out there to consume your customer feedback, analyze it for sentiment, and highlight the outliers. If people are particularly happy or angry, you should look deeper into why. And if they're not, that's a concern too, but you should know which way the wind is blowing. Same goes for social media. Feed your Facebook, Twitter, Yelp, whatever, into a senti sentiment anal analyzer and measure your performance. My point in all of this is, and it might sting a bit, is who cares about the servers, really? They're just boxes of expensive dirt. What you should be measuring and monitoring is your success. Okay, so now we're at the heart of it. What I like to call dashboard-driven development. 
the idea that the very nucleus of Agile is to measure, iterate, and learn from that. To start off, make sure you understand the status quo. You should measure what your users do and where your value comes from and make sure that your whole team understands the lie of the land. This helps you concentrate your effort where the value is. I hope I don't have to convince people that testing is valuable, software is brittle, testing before release tests against a fixed set of conditions, but once the software goes out the door, conditions are continually changing. So your dashboards are a kind of test that keeps running after you ship to make sure that the software keeps working the way you intended. But one benefit of testing at release time under static conditions is that you can compare this release to the last one. So another important thing to do is to look for trends in performance and responsiveness over time and identify any looming problems that you've got there. Would you be scared to put your release out on a Friday afternoon? Why is that? If you have a system that needs a team of people on deck in case it explodes, I think you've got room for improvement. I'm waiting for the day that NASA stopped doing countdowns. I don't want to hear three, two, one, lift off. Oh, thank goodness nothing exploded. I want to hear, you're clear to proceed to runway five whenever you want. Have a nice flight. I said this earlier, but I want to repeat it. Techniques like pair programming, literate programming, rubber duck debugging, they all work because the very act of having to explain yourself causes you to think more thoroughly. So building a dashboard is asking yourself, how do I prove that I did a good job? And also consider all the users and whether they're going to think that. It's not enough to build a feature such that it works. Developing is communicating. And you need to communicate to your internal customers so that they can know if their design worked, if their marketing campaign worked, so that support can diagnose why a user is having a hard time. So your dashboards are a way to measure your success, because that's the real question when you're deciding whether or not your work is ready to go out the door. You want to know that you did what you set out to do, and conversely, that if you fail to do it, the right people are going to learn about that. So that's a strategy. Those are the things that I want you to do. The rest of this talk is going to be about some ways to get there. You need to love your data as much as you code, to refactor it when needed and review it and look for problems in it. Businesses have always been swimming in more data than they realize. And you can learn interesting things by bringing it all together. For example, correlate your page load time to your conversion rate to see how much it really matters if the site has a bit of a slow day. These are some tools that I really like, and I'll go into them in more detail. But the thing that these three, three tools pictured here have in common is that you can build a dashboard that's targeted to answer a particular question in half an hour or so, and then ship that dashboard out to consumer con data consumers, or just throw it away when you're done. It's quick enough, it's cheap enough, it's easy enough to build these things in bulk and ship them through like code. What we want to do is empower developers to be able to explore and manipulate data. This means that they need access to those tools. So if you're hosting your own software, you need to make sure that your developers have, have access to the business intelligence stack so that they can build instances of those services and have a working installation to be able to run dashboards against their own code as they build it. And you should choose, choose tools that let you ship dashboards as artifacts somehow. You don't have to manually recreate your database in a live system. That can be through shipping configuration files through replicating databases through other techniques that I'll go into later. And lastly, be proud of your dashboards. Demonstrate them in your product showcases. You know, treat them as achievements. And when it comes to QA, you need to ensure that dashboards are the first class citizens. You need to assure their quality. You're targeting dashboards at management, support, customers. You can't be lying to them. OK, so next I want to look at integrating dashboards into your DevOps workflow. I spoke earlier about preferring tools that let you ship dashboards as artifacts. With the right tools, you can version control and code review your dashboards. The tools I like to use have wonderful visual editors, but still allow you to export the configuration as meaningful text. There's also some benefit in using perceptual diffing tools to highlight what you change from one iteration to the next. These tools can take a before and after screenshot of a user interface and then highlight the areas that have changed. And you can automate the run of that against your software releases. 
And you absolutely can do all kinds of automated testing on dashboards. You can unit test your data handling logic in isolation, and you can provide known data to your rendering and user interactions to confirm that you get the expected behavior. It's important to assure consistent long-term behavior too. You should look at injecting failures into your test runs and confirming that your monitoring notices them and does the right thing. You don't want to go to bed thinking that you're, you're going to know about outages and then wake up to find that, that your monitoring didn't work. I like to break things and see what happens and whether I have enough information to diagnose. It's an awful feeling to be in the middle of an incident at 2am and wishing that you'd logged this piece of one data that would have told you what the problem really is. And when you're happy with your dashboards, you should be able to deploy them with no fuss. It, so many of the tools I've used are capable of deploying configuration files in just the same way as you deploy code. And where that's not possible, look at whether there's an API in the tool or a database or some way to transport configuration from development to staging to production. So lastly, I want to give you some examples of tools that I like to use and how I've used them. Now, I hope you're already familiar with tools like Elk or Splunk or similar. Um, it's a crowded marketplace. These are tools that will turn your log files and your other data streams into a data lake that you can then query quite quickly in real time. And what I like about Elk is that you can start by just dumping in your log files and your server stats and maybe your network stats and just look at what patterns emerge. And then when you decide that you're interested in a particular area, you target your logging at facilitating that analysis. One of the reasons it's important to build dashboards as you write the code is that you are thinking about whether the, what information the dashboard is going to need. Another good point about Kibana, which is the user interface component of the Elk stack, is that its configuration can be made nicely readable. You build all the searches and dashboards interactively in a web browser, and then you export everything as JSON, run it through a pretty printer, and you can automate the entire commit review test deploy pipeline with nicely readable text changes. So here's an example of a Kibana dashboard. I actually stole this from their website. Um, all these elements can be built and refined in a web browser. And then, as I say, you export the configuration as JSON data, and you can copy it from server to server. Another tool which I really love is called Node-RED. Now, this is a JavaScript programming environment, which was originally created for building automation and IoT. And it lets you visually connect devices, APIs, and databases, and web pages in interesting ways. Um, in a business setting, it's great for pulling data from multiple sources and acting on the big picture. It has plugins for pretty much every database, message bus, and web API that you could find. Where I want to do trend analysis, or adaptive filtering, or sentiment analysis, this is the tool that I reach for most often. If you have your traffic data in Elasticsearch, and your sales data in Postgres, and your service stats in Redis, and you want to produce some report or alert that combines pieces of all of that, then you can build a flow in Node-RED that pulls all that information together. So here's an example. This is, for decades, we've been hearing about how one day programming will we just be dragging boxes around and, and joining them up with lines. Well, that's always been bogus, and it's still bogus. But this tool is as close, I think, as we are going to get. And it's a lot of fun to learn and to quickly build uh, data workflows. So in this case, we're pulling business goal data from Elasticsearch. That's checkouts per second and um, how many new signups today. We're summarizing that to give some day, daily metrics and a, and a trend. And then we're pushing it up to an iPhone app, um, which operation staff, management, whoever's interested can get that app on their phone and look at your data. Um, I'll tell you some more about the, the iPhone dashboards later. But to continue on Node-RED, you, you work by building programs called flows, which are a collection of nodes that receive messages, process them, and emit modified or completely different messages. So each node is rep an NPM module. So it's a chunk of code that you've taken off the shelf. And these nodes themselves are fully amenable to unit testing and any of the Node.js test frameworks. And you write your flows, and if you write your flows, by grouping your logic into libraries, which give, sort of compress it all down to a single node, 
then you can unit test that node by pr providing test input and test output and put the same node into your production flow and know that it's going to behave the way you expect. And once again, all this visually constructed code exports into JSON for review and deployment. So here's an example of the kinds of dashboards you can build directly in Node-RED. It has its own dashboarding engine built in. Um, and on the right is, a, is an iPhone app called Blink, which pulls data from a cloud service or from self-hosted data. And my Node-RED flows are pushing their output up to the Blink cloud to produce these dashboards. So to tell you some more about Blink, um, this is another app that was created for use with IoT but which really has good applications for business dashboarding. Each dashboard is associated with a data store in their cloud, and you can pass dashboards around by generating QR codes. So there's two ways to distribute an app. You can share it where the layout is red. Um, the layout is available to people to use, but they can't modify it and they, they're seeing the same data, so that it's basically multiple users of a single dashboard, or you can clone it so that everybody gets their own editable copy of the dashboard and connects it to their own data store. So sharing is how you ship dashboards to your users. You make one using the company account and you hand it out to all the staff. And then cloning is how you pass them through your pipeline. Developers clone the production app, modify it, and ship their clone as part of their release. So here's a more complicated example. In fact, this is laughably complicated because it was one of my early prototypes. Um, you would, in practice, compress that down to a, a number of libraries which you test and join together. But what this does is, again, pulls performance data from, from Elasticsearch. And we had a problem where we were seeing unexplained spikes in the error rate from our mobile API. And we wanted to know what could possibly be causing them. Um, and to give us a quick notification when that happens. So in this case, you know, we threw this together in half an hour to answer the question. Um, it not only provides a blink dashboard, it also sends instant notifications to the operations team if a problem is detected. The last thing I want to talk about in terms of, in terms of software systems is social media in integration. So Node-RED has got good support for various um, social media feeds. So you can use simple but powerful onboard sentiment analysis, or you can push text out to IBM Watson for, for deeper textual analysis. So one very simple possibility is when you get people talking about you on social media, send a heads up to your Slack channels. You know, it's a great way to keep in touch with your users. But maybe you want to forward your five-star reviews onto marketing for quoting, or forward your one-star reviews onto support for follow-up. Um, I've done a series of talks last year on, on things that you can do with these tools, and you can find links to those on my website. So I, I encourage you to, to follow up or get in touch if you want to know more about those applications. So let's summarize what I've talked about. Your first step is to identify who your data is for and make sure it's in a form palatable to them. Next, you want to think about new ways to use data beyond just graphs and use that thought process to inform your software design. After that, you should treat your dashboards like code. Review them, test them, demonstrate them, and ship them using automated tools. And finally, pull together different sources, synthesize the big picture. So thanks for your time today. I'm happy to take questions in the next few minutes, and I'm here all week if you want to have a longer chat. So over to you. All right, are there any questions? Um, I'm not really a dashboard guy, so I just had one quick query, I guess, um, regarding the red stuff that sounded interesting, and you were mentioning the black for the mobile platform. Those two examples that you gave, I assume, were different dashboard backends. Is that something that's um, uh, like automatically adaptable? Can you make a dashboard that will present one way on, say, a web view, and another way if it's presented in something like a Blink platform on a mobile? Um, what were, is this the slide you're talking about? Yeah. What we're looking at here on the left is Node-RED's own dashboarding. It's quite responsive, so it works well on desktop. It's, it's actually 
Um, if you have smart TVs around your, your building and they've got their own web browser built in, it works well on them. A lot of sites don't work well on smart TV web browsers. Um, and it automatically adjusts itself to be mobile. So what you're looking at there, if you viewed that on a mobile, you would get those three dashboards vertically instead of horizontally. So that one dashboard will work, desktop, big screen, mobile. Uh, Blink is targeted solely at mobile. So they're Android first. They have good support on Android. Um, also good on iOS, um, but they're focusing purely on mobile. Yeah. You wouldn't be putting the mobile app for that same dashboard when you would combine the information about them. Is that right? You'd be looking at different data sets for each mobile one, and it's all right. Um, the question was about whether you would have separate data sets for mobile. Yeah. Um, it's really out of scope for the tool. It's the, the, the Blink application is essentially a key value store. Whatever whatever metrics you push up to their cloud storage are then available to be shown in the app that's associated with that store. You basically got a bunch of global variables that you're right to and they mean whatever you want them to mean. Anyone else? Raise your hand. All right, thank you folks. All right, thank you.